The church say amen. amen. Our Christmas holiday is over, but the celebration continues. We want to welcome you to Pathways, the contemporary service here at Orange United Methodist Church, especially if you're visiting with us today. We're so glad you joined us. My name is Gary Mitchell. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and we are very excited to enter into a time of worship this morning. If you are visiting, we want to make sure that you sign the cue pads that are at the end of the world. That just gives us a little information. Uh, letting us know that you were here and ways that we can contact you. We're so, so glad you joined us. And our theme this morning in worship is the glory and the greatness of God over all of creation, all of nature. We've got a lot of songs to sing this morning that have imagery of the oceans and the mountains and the trees and the valleys. And so I just wanted to help you focus in on the greatness of and the majesty of God in all creation. In order to do that, we've got a reading this morning. We often open our services with a reading from the Word of God. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet in honor of the Word of God. And this is a reading from Psalm 29. It says, Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bow down to the Lord in holy splendor. The Lord's voice is over the waters, the glorious God thunders. The Lord's voice is strong. The Lord's voice is majestic. The Lord's voice breaks cedar trees. Yes, the Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. What do you say we read these words together? Here we go. The Lord's voice unleashes fiery flames. The Lord's voice shakes the wilderness. The Lord's voice convulses the oaks. Strips the forest bare, but in his temple everyone shouts glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood waters. The Lord sits enthroned, king forever. Let the Lord give strength to his people. Let the Lord bless his people with peace. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we gather together here in your house to exalt you, to celebrate you. And God, we lift up this service that you would speak to us and that you would change our hearts with the majesty and the greatness of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people sing. Amen. Amen. Take this. All creation looks to you. All provision comes from you. Oh, my God. 
church say amen? amen? So I'm feeling like we're a little sluggish this morning, so I want you to do something. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to grab them. Uh, shoulders just like this, and I want you to shake them. <laughs> Thank you. 
together. Father God, open our eyes to the promises that you have made us and give us the courage and the faith to trust you and to believe that you are exactly who we've heard that you are, that you can do exceedingly more than all we ask or imagine. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts. We're looking in chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Now, I hear these words. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? Into John's baptism, they answered. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and all together there were about the of them. Church, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The ushers are going to get ready to come by and receive this morning's tithes and offerings, but they're also going to give you something. We've had a wonderful start to the year, and so they have a one. Hundred dollar bill for each of you. That's not true at all. I'm sorry. That's, that's not true. But they are going to give you something. The usher's going to come forward, and then we've got uh, uh, a note card that you're going to get. We're going to use those a little bit later in the service. So right now, just hang on to it. Uh, but the ushers will come forward, and then after the basket has passed you by, and you've got your note card, stand on up and join us for worship. I feel like I should apologize. That was kind of getting me. I'm sorry. <laughs>
possível. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, looking at the very beginning, Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. But he proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven and said, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This church is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Saints of Orange. Good morning. See you this morning. It is good to be seen. It is good to be seen. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, your attention. A few hundred here. I'm just glad that certain folks were here. Linda and Sheila, our financial, I'm glad to have a stroke, I think. Uh, and Harold, wherever you are, thank you for your, you were some of us old folks got that. We appreciate that. We're glad to see you too. Uh, you heard the announcement Carol gave about all the activities that went on, the, uh, the opportunities for formation. We hope you'll come out and be a part of those. Those are times of good fellowship and learning together. That's what we're trying to do. We're, we're worshiping together, learning together, living and serving together. That's what we want to do. So we hope you'll come out. I hope some of you will come out and be part of my class. Uh, some of us, we're not cradle Methodists. I'm one of you. I, I came from a different uh, denomination. Therefore, I needed to learn about Methodism. And some of us need to be reminded if we were even if we were afraid of that. So we hope you'll come out and be a part of that. Uh, in an October 20th, 2014 article on the Denison Forum for Truth and Culture, Jim Denison talks about an interesting trend that's going on in the area of religion and the Christian faith or lack thereof. He talks about a group called the National Secular Society. This society offers to atheists an opportunity to come to the website and print off a certificate that in effect revokes their baptism. According to what Denison wrote in the article, 100,000 people have taken advantage of this service over the last five years. Another site called unbaptized.org provides a similar service. Their certificate reads, whatever your name is, having willingly undergone the rite of baptism, now understand the error of your belief. Therefore, you revoke any and all implications of said baptismal rite and renounce any and all churches that perform them. Now, I've heard of buyer's remorse before, but believer's remorse? Apparently. You know, when you think about it, that's a pretty drastic step to take, isn't it? That's a real line of demarcation uh, between before and after, if you will. It has something to say about our perceived sense of identity, does it not? But then again, so does baptism. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you remember your baptism? How many of you remember your baptism? A lot of us do. Some of us were baptized as little itty bitty ones brought before the altar of the people by our parents. We don't remember the actual event. We know that we have been baptized. Some of us 
were old enough to actually remember the baptism, how cold the water was, we're able to remember that momentous day in our life. Some of us even ducked properly, according to some of us out there. But what does baptism really mean for us as believers? For some folks, I don't think it means a whole lot. It's a little more than the fulfillment of a family tradition. It's something that we do for the little ones in our care. We can get all dressed up and get the relatives to come to church once in a year. And then have a big party afterwards. The truth of the matter is that baptism is so much more than that. Baptism is the sign act that operates as a means of God's grace in our lives, as a means through which God pours His grace into us. He washes away original sin, and it imparts to us a new identity as a child of God. Baptism also is the sign act through which we begin to understand something of the true nature and the true identity of God. That's something we need to understand this morning. Who's this God that we serve? We need to know. Joshua Harris in his book, Dug Down Deep, had this to say. When we understand the truth about God, we are filled with a sense of wonder. If we fail to understand the true nature of God, then we will not be in awe of Him as we should. We won't worship Him like we ought to. We won't run to Him for refuge when we need to. And we'll never understand the depth of His love for us and the great distance He has covered in reaching out to save us. My friends, you and I live in the midst of a world that continually tries to tell us that the God of the Scriptures is no different than any other so-called belief system. We live in a world that continually tries to force an identity on us according to their standard rather than the way things really are. And in that sort of world, we desperately need to understand who we are and who God is. And it's in the sign act of baptism that we gain an understanding of that identity. So as we reflect on our text once more for a few moments, I invite us into that space where we are able to remember with thanksgiving and to be filled with the grace of God's Holy Spirit as we look into the waters and see the signs of baptism. One thing we've got to understand about the Gospel of Mark, it is what I call the dragnet gospel. Just facts. It is, some people call it the immediate gospel. The Gospel of Mark cuts through all of the superfluous stuff and gets to the point. And that's what's going on in our text for today. We're four verses into the first chapter, and we find Jesus coming to the Jordan to be baptized by John. It's still going to be a little bit of time, even for Mark, before he gathers a group around him to follow him and talks about giving his life as a ransom for many. But here, just four verses in, we can already see the foreshadowing of this truth. It's important for us also to understand that Jesus came to the waters that day not as a confession of any personal guilt, not to receive any personal cleansing. He did not come there to undergo baptism as a means of pleasing his family, as some scholars have advocated. Rather, he came there that day and entered the waters in fulfillment of his identity as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He came that day to identify with us and to share with us in this act 
something of the identity and the nature of God. And we need to understand that as we begin to look and see the signs of baptism. Now what are these signs of baptism you talk about, Ken? I'm glad you asked. As Jesus entered the waters of baptism that day, we can see very clearly the signs of God's majesty. But God's majesty, His otherness, if you will. James K.A. Smith, in an August 2014 article for Cardis website, talks about an interesting painting that's hanging in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan. It's a painting entitled The Vision of St. John. It was painted by the great artist master El Greco. It was completed sometime around 1614. It, uh, it's, uh, it's inspiration was Revelation 6, 9 to 11. The fifth seal, I think, is being broken there. And the martyrs are being rewarded. And John is lifting his hands and his eyes heavenward. But it's interesting for us to understand that the painting that hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art is not the painting as it originally appeared. In 1880, there was a restoration project on the, the painting, and 68 inches of that painting, about half of the painting, came away. And as a result, it looks as if the martyrs are being rewarded by no one. John is reaching his eyes and his hands heavenward to no one. He's praising where nothing seems to be existing. He's looking for something that's not there. Wow, is that not a powerful picture of the state of spirituality in the world in which we live today? A lot of people looking. I'll find that a lot. Our culture has boiled life down a little more than cold logic and determinism. And it's in that kind of a world that we can look and see the discontent that resides in every human soul. A desire to reach out and know something of the transcendent. A desire to reach out and know something of otherness. A desire, dare I say it, to reach out and know the majesty of and it's in this sign act of baptism that we see played out in our text for the day that we can see the otherness, the transcendence, the majesty of God being played out for us. You don't get a whole lot more majestic than the heavens opening, a dove descending, and God speaking. That's pretty dramatic. That's pretty majestic. And in the midst of life's trials and tribulations, we today need to be able to reach out and touch something of the majesty, the transcendence of God. We need to know a God who is large and in charge. We need to know a Savior whose master went in water and one for whom our physical brokenness our emotional brokenness, the brokenness of our lives, are manageable situations. We need to know a God who's big enough to walk through the fire with us and turn us from victims into victors. Amen. We need to touch that God. We need to be in contact with that God. And the blessed and amazing thing about baptism is that in those waters, we are able to reach out and to touch and to know something of that God, to be touched by the transcendence and the majesty of God our Savior, who entered the water for our sake. So we can see God's majesty. We're also able to look in these waters today and know something about the mercy of God, God's mercy. Jesus came and humbled himself and became obedient unto death even death on a cross. And he did it that we might know freedom from the law of sin and death. There are a lot of people who will look around and tell you that in the, the beauty of the created order we see God's hand, and I believe that. But I'm telling you that as we look with our mind's eye at our text and we see Jesus <coughs> entering the water, I'm telling you right now, we can see fully on display the nature of God's heart. God's heart. 
It is in baptism that we can clearly see the love and the mercy that are cornerstones of God's nature, cornerstones of God's identity. And the amazing thing is this, that that same love and mercy are now supposed to become part of our identity as we go through those waters. We're also called to mercy. That's important for us to remember in the world in which we live, is it not? Historian Rodney Stark in his book, The Triumph of Christianity, talks about how Christianity exploded in growth amazingly, phenomenally, over two centuries from being a persecuted faith to becoming the religion of the known world at the time. And it's Stark's argument that one of the main grace-filled, spirit-filled factors for this occurring was the insistence on the Christian revolutionary doctrine of mercy. Stark says that in the midst of the misery and the illness and the squalor of the ancient world, it was the insistence of the Christians on teaching and living out this doctrine of mercy that made them singularly different from everybody else in the world. According to him, mercy was regarded by the pagan world as a character flaw. And pity was a pathological emotion. Because mercy required you to give unearned relief, unearned help. It was seen as something that contravened justice. And therefore, it was a character flaw. And that's the moral environment in which Christianity grew and began to thrive. These were people who stood up and said, because we know a God of mercy, we are called to practice mercy among one another and toward the world. And for everybody that wants to sit up there this morning and say, well, all religions are alike, I say you better go back and check this central figure and meaning of our identity. You don't find that in every other religion. You don't find this cornerstone of mercy. <clears throat> Even now, mercy is in perilously short supply in the world in which we live. In a world that tries to teach us and condition us to respond to every so-called slight and disrespect and injustice with violence and hatred, we must remember that through those waters of baptism, we've been called to one, to follow the one who turned the other cheek. The one who looked at us in our brokenness, in our lostness, and in the fullness of time became the means by which God's mercy came running toward us. You see God's mercy. Looking in these waters this morning, we can also see something of God's mission. God's mission that has now been imparted to us. It's important for us as we look in the water and see the, the majesty and the mercy of God that we understand that those are not meant exclusively for us alone. They are meant for the whole world. There's more than enough majesty, more than enough mercy. There's more than enough salvation and grace for the whole world if they'll only come to it, if they'll only submit their lives to the Lordship of Jesus. If only the world knew that. If only our neighbors knew that. Amen? Amen. Well, how in the world are they going to know about that? They have to learn it from us. They have to learn it from us. Even as we enter the waters of baptism with our Lord, as he invites us to do, he also calls us to emerge from those waters and to enter into the world and share the glad tidings of his gospel of grace. You know what, brothers and sisters, that's who we became when we entered those waters. We, through those waters, became instruments in God's ministry of grace reconciliation. That's who we are. 
In an April 2006 article in USA Today, Kathleen Grossman uh, wrote this article. It's entitled Baptismal Rites, R-I-T-E-S, Trickling Away. Talk about an interesting trend that's going on in some parts of our country where people are undergoing baptismal life rites, but with no mention of God. One particular parent was interviewed, and this is what the parent said. The parent said this, said, we just want our child to be guided by a larger spirit, but we don't want to get specific. We just want all of her bases covered. <laughs> the parents, one time Presbyterian, certainly no more, <coughs> went on to, to say this. The mother went on to say this. She said, we do Christianity light for our baby who believes in angels and fairies and leprechauns and Santa Claus. Do we need to tell the story? Amen. Sounds like we do. And I've got some news for that poor mama and for all the others who think they're just covering their bases this morning. You may not want to be specific, but God in Christ Jesus did just that. He specifically came among us as one of us. He specifically entered the waters that day to identify with us in our brokenness and to share with us the identity of a merciful and loving God. He specifically suffered and died and was raised again in order that we might have abundant and eternal life. And he has specifically called us to share this specific message with the whole world. Specifically. <laughs> And if we do anything other than that, we're just playing in the water. This is something that our world needs more than any program we could design, any practice that we could implement. Our world desperately needs to know they can become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something this morning. We live in a world that increasingly is making it difficult for us to remain ambiguous about our true nature. More and more we are being challenged to take a stand, to claim an identity, or else risk the world Imposing one on us. For those of us who have entered the waters of baptism this morning, I want you to understand that there is an identity out there for you that can be yours if you choose to claim it. You may not remember your actual baptism, but you may know that you've been baptized. This morning, I invite you <coughs> to remember this identity that has been given to you and remember the identity of the one who gave it to you by his grace. I invite you to receive his Holy Spirit, his power to live into that identity. Understand that we serve this God of majesty, this God of mercy, and a God who calls us to be in mission with himself. This morning, my brothers and sisters, remember who you are and whose you are. Remember your baptism. And be Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning, we want to do something special. A lot of times when we participate in worship, when we participating in an action that really impresses it upon us even more. We want to do that. If you received a piece of paper a little while ago and a, and a pen, we want, to write, we want you to invite, we want you to write down something on that piece of paper that, that you want to leave, something of that old life, that old identity that you wish to leave at the waters of baptism. As a sign that you come to those waters, you leave that there and you emerge as a new creation in Christ Jesus. In a few moments we'll have a prayer.
over the water. We're going to put some water in these bowls and invite you to come forward and to touch that water and remember who you are. Remember your identity. And remember God's identity in Christ Jesus. As you leave, after you, after you drop off your, your card, that which you want to leave at the water, you'll notice that there's these little, these little uh, papers, gifts from the water that are up here on the board. We want to invite you to tear one of those off as a visible reminder to you what you've received as a part of this new identity that you have in Jesus Christ. Carry that with you and realize you're not who you used to be. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this is a gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit, and by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. Because it's Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, come to the waters. Remember who you are. And be thankful. Let's just take a few moments and think about what you want to leave of that old life. What about yourself and who you've been? Do you want to leave? Write that down when you're ready and you can come on up and do exactly as Ken has instructed. When you return to your seats, go ahead and remain standing and sing this song with us. Thank you. 